That's what we're talking about today in our series, Redefined. Do not judge. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Some of you, this is the only verse you know in the Bible. <laughs> Don't worry, there's more to the Bible. Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Do not judge. For the sake of this topic, when Pastor Paolo asked me, I thought to myself, let me try to see just how judgmental I am. You know, let's just measure, not for a month, that wouldn't be too much. You know, I don't have, I can't count that high. But let me just, for this week, let's just count the number of judgmental thoughts and impulses, not even in a week, in a day. No, 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 forget the day. In a single drive to the office, how many judgmental thoughts will I have? You know, I'm it. This guy's slowing down, stopping and slowing, and just getting mad. And it was just so many opportunities. Traffic, so many opportunities for judgment. And now I have a son who calls me on it. Papa, why did you shout at him? And he's not trying to, to condemn me, but he's just wondering, why were you shouting? And I'm like, um, because... Because Papa's judgmental this week. <laughs> uh, parking. So many opportunities for judgment, isn't there? Um, you see someone, you're, you're trying to get into a parking space, and you see someone straddling two lines, as if your cars are expensive. You know, you, you have all of these thoughts about this person, you know, like, who does he think he is? And we don't know that. Or social media. Social media gives us so many opportunities for people to air their judgments, right? YouTube comments, Facebook comments, just so many judgments spoken here and there. I'm not like that. You know, I'm not someone who airs my judgments. I'm someone who sees people do that and judges them silently. Uh, I'm a lurking judgment there. Anybody like that here? You're like lurkingly judgmental. You're like, you never post it, but in your mind, oh, another selfie. Oopa, verse, verse, kapa, diba? And all of these different things, you add them in your thoughts. And maybe you never said it, but if there was a microphone in our home, or if there was an app that translated our thoughts into social media posts, Lord, if you mark our transgressions, who could stand? Really, really, all of us would be guilty of this. And is this what this verse saying? This verse tells us, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. What is this saying? See, there's two extremes people have in dealing with this text. One extreme people have is they say, judge not, judge not. That's the only Bible verse they know. That's probably their only, uh, the, you know, that's on their uh, picture frame, in the, or maybe it's their bio. You ever see people like that? Um, you go on their social media, Joseph Bonifacio, Facebook, bio, only God can judge me. Oh, okay, okay. It's like, I, I already have a judgment for people who that's their bio, okay? But some people say that that's what it means. Nobody should make a judgment. Nobody can call each other out on what's wrong. They say, judge not, only God can judge me, or in Tagalog, walang basagan ng trip. We'll say different things like that. In other words, don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. This is my business. Is that what the Bible is saying? No. Later on, in this same verse, John, uh, Matthew chapters, in this same chapter, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus will tell the disciples, and we'll tackle it in this series, you will know them by their fruit. In other words, you're supposed to make a judgment call. You're supposed to make a decision on what right and wrong is. Je John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus himself is quoted as saying, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. In other words, this verse is not saying, this verse is not a, a call to abandon judgment completely, to turn off discernment, or to even stop from calling one another out on sin. There is a right way and a wrong way to judge, is what this verse is saying. The other extreme, though, that we know about is the wrong way to judge. The harsh, the condemning, the self-righteous, the condescending way of judging. And let's be honest, Christians, we can be very good at that, can't we? I know I can. I've done that. One of the most memorable times that I've done that is I remember 11 years ago, I did it while preaching. 
while giving an altar call. And some of you know this story. I, I, um, someone shared a testimony. I was asked to give the altar call at the end. And I gave the usual thing that pastors say, if you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ today and trust that He will change you. You know what? It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. And put your faith in Jesus and He will change you. Just raise your hand and we'll believe that God will, will come into your heart and give you a new start. And there was a lady in the front row. And I didn't know her personally. I knew of her. She, she was a celebrity. And she raised her hand. And immediately when she raised her hand, my first thought was, oh, come on. You? Jesus will change your life after everything you've done. Because she was infamous. You know, and though, 11 years ago, people knew who she was and what she did and what kind of job she did. So everybody knew that about her. And so when she raised her hand, I was in the front thinking, I don't really believe that God... Yeah, sure. You know? And you know how usually after the service, the pastor will go up and meet the person and say, hey, we'd like you to get connected. I didn't do that this time because I'm like, I'm not wasting my time with people like that. Terrible, judgmental. God rebuked me because months later, I was reading the entertainment page and an entertainment columnist wrote about her. And the entertainment columnist said, has Rika Peralejo really changed? <laughs> Has God, something's happened to this woman. She's not accepting the role she used to accept. She's living differently. And I felt like God tell me, that entertainment columnist believes the gospel more than you do. I just remember just tears, just dropping on the newspaper. As I repented, saying, Lord, I, I'm so sorry. I judged that girl. Help me. Help me not to be this way. I didn't expect that three years later, she'd be my wife. <laughs> and she's a living testimony to me <laughs> of 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Yes. Judgmental. There's a right way and a wrong way. So the question is not one extreme of don't judge at all, turn off your thinking, everything's fine. No, no, we need to judge. We need to call out one another when we're sinning. But there's a right way to do it. The other extreme is also wrong of being harsh and condemning and assuming for the other person what God's doing in their life. That's not our place. What makes something wrong? What makes judging someone wrong? What's the wrong way to judge? In a nutshell, it's simply when we put ourselves in the place of God. Wrong judging assumes the place of God. Romans chapter 14, verse 4 says this, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Many of us here have household help, don't we? We have people who work for us, who serve us in our homes, drivers or, 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 or helpers. If someone else was to go into our home, and start ordering them around. Hey, don't, don't do that. Don't cook it that way. What would you say? Um, you're welcome to stay if you want, but shut up. Not your house. <laughs> you don't pay their salary. You know, you don't talk to them that way. I talk to them that way. And this verse is God telling us that we're doing the same thing. You're not the master of your brother or sister. God is. We can call them out and say, hey, I wouldn't do that if I were you because I think God says something differently, but you're not the boss. I'm not the boss. James 4 verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? There's one lawgiver and one judge, and it's not us. It's Jesus. Now, we might be saying here, no, 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 Pastor Joseph, I don't think I'm God. I just think this person's wrong. Right? Yes. But we do presume the place of God when we cast judgment sometimes. How do we do that? Well, different ways. Number one, we think we have complete information of the situation. We think we know everything like God does. So we see someone driving and he slows down and we're already late and we're in a rush. So this person's slowing down. Oh, this person is so slow and this person is not efficient. This is why the Philippines is poor. Wow, that poor person. <laughs> the poverty of the nation <laughs> is because of their driving habits. And then we overtake and we're so mad. Maybe we're even laying on our horn. And then when we pass, we see there's an emergency. Maybe someone was sick. Maybe they got into an accident. And then what happens? Ah, Lord, Lord help them. We don't know. We don't have complete information in the situation. 
You know how else we assume to be God? When we judge motives and intentions. The Bible says no one knows the thoughts of the man except the man's spirit within him. And yet that's how we are. That's how I am. When someone's inefficient, you're lazy. When my wife doesn't do something that I want right away, she doesn't love me as much as I love her. What? You don't know that. But we've already judged the motive and intention. God sees their heart. We don't. We see their actions, we feel their actions, and we can bring that to the light and we can say, hey, these are your actions and these are the effects. Now, can you help me understand your motive behind them? You know how else we assume to be God? We, we make ourselves the standard. You're wrong for doing that because I would never do that. You're wrong for failing to do this because look at me, I can do this. You know, oh, these people in my office are so inconsiderate. They never refill the coffee. But I always refill the coffee. Ikaw na. Good, congratulations. A gold medal on you for being the one who refills the coffee every day. <laughs> but maybe that's not their job. I think it is though. But, but, but maybe it's not their job. But the point is we make ourselves the standard. Isn't that the case often? Spouses, I know it is for me. When I often get angry with Carla, it's with things that I do and she doesn't do, and I think you are wrong because I always, and you don't. Well, who said I'm the standard? You know how else we, we, we take the place of God when we think our judgment is right? We think our judgment is, 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 is the right way to do things. In the Lord of the Rings series, sorry, I'm going to spoil it for you, but it's a really old movie. You should have seen it by now. But in the Lord of the Rings series, uh, the character of Gollum is one of the most irritating and one of the most annoying characters. Every single character has something strong and admirable about them, even the bad people. Saruman, it's like he's so good, but he's just corrupted, you know? But Gollum has nothing lovable about him. There's nothing great about him. He's just irritating and whiny and just, just like, uh, so obsessed with his precious, you know? He's just so irritating that you just want to, like, why is he even here, you know? Like, he's, that's his point. And in the first movie of the trilogy, The Fellowship of the Ring, uh, Frodo sees Gollum following them in the mines of Moria, and he just gets mad, and he says, Bilbo should have killed that guy when he had a chance. And then Gandalf, being so wise, stops and looks at Frodo, and he gives this statement. He says, do not be eager to deal out death in judgment. Even the very wise cannot see all ends. My heart tells me that Gollum has some part to play yet, for good or ill. And sure enough, that's what happens. Fellowship of the Ring, he's so irritating. Two Towers, he's irritating. Return of the King, he's really irritating. And at the end of the movie, when the task is finally about to be completed, they're going to throw the ring into Mount Doom. The whole point of the whole trilogy of 15 hours of movies is finally about to be fulfilled and Frodo flinches from the task. He himself becomes corrupted by the ring. It becomes his precious. And he's unable to cast it into the fires of Mount Doom. And it's only Gollum, the greedy, sniveling guy. He doesn't change. He grabs it and jumps into the volcano with it. And it gets destroyed. The task is fulfilled because of that great big loser. Gandalf says, even the very wise cannot see all ends. See, we cast judgments on people. They shouldn't be there. Should they break up? Get this person out of the church. We don't know how things will end. That's what I love about Pastor Paolo. Can I just say, I love that about him. The humility on our leader here. I mean, he leads the, the biggest Metro Manila location, but he doesn't throw his weight around. When he wants to make a suggestion to the other pastors, he wins them over one by one. And I'm like, why are you doing that? You could just tell them, look, the fort wants to do this. But he doesn't because he knows he doesn't know everything, even though he knows a lot. There's this leadership situation before where we had a, a person on staff, a campus missionary, who I was like, you know what, we should just get this person out of the team. And we got the, the, the council together, and, and the people said, you know what, let's just give him another chance. And I said, ah. And so it, you know, we decided, but in a moment, a personal moment between the two of us, I said, Pastor Paolo, I just wish, you know, just, I don't see how this person is going to change. I don't know why we're bending over backwards. He's lazy. He's, he's not adding to the value of the team. Just get him out of the team. And in his super gentle manner, and it's the gentleness that makes the correction more painful, you know? In his super gentle manner, well, Joseph, 
If I am going to err on one side between law or grace, I'd rather err on grace. <sighs> Thank you, Pastor Paolo. <laughs> and sure enough, that's what happened. A few months later, the person didn't change and was still exited from the ministry. But because of the extra effort to build, to connect, to correct gently, that person got restored in the faith, is still part of the church, and their family is intact. And I just look back and I say, thank you. We don't know everything. You know how else we presume to be God? We presume to be God by thinking we have to make a judgment at all. Who made us the judge? It's none of our business. There are some things we're called to judge. Parents, you're supposed to help your children decide right from wrong. If you're a business owner, a leader, a disciple, there's things you need to do. But there are lots of things we don't need to judge. We don't need to make a comment on. In fact, we can do that later. Let's go on our social media and look at posts. And when you feel like judging, remind yourself, none of my business. None of my business. None of my business. Because it isn't. We're not God. The wrong way to judge is when we presume to be God. The right way to judge is when we remember who we are. We know we're, we're judging the wrong way when we refuse to forgive, when we're overly critical. You know, the person can't do anything right anymore in our eyes. Everything they do, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, you know. We write them off as hopeless. We don't give them a chance to reconcile or to redeem. All of these are judgments. What does good judgment look like then, according to this verse? This verse gives us three marks of what right judgment looks like. The first one, right judgment, is reflexive. Reflexive. Reflexive is a grammatical term that simply means a word that describes itself, that goes back on itself. It talks about itself first. Or to give it a simple analogy, it's what our parents have said to us for a long time. When you point at someone, one finger is pointing at them, and how many are pointing back at you? Three. Three fingers are pointing right back at me. In other words, if we're going to apply judgment on other people, let's apply it on ourselves first. There's a Calvin and Hobbes strip that, um, you guys know Calvin and Hobbes? I, I grew up reading this all the time. And there's a Calvin and Hobbes strip where, I, I love it. It's one of those big rants that Calvin has. And he goes, some people complain all the time. They complain about the least thing. If something bugs them, they never let go of it. They go on and on long after anyone else is interested. It's just complain, complain, complain. People who gripe all the time really drive me nuts. You'd think they'd change the subject after a while, but they never do. They just keep griping until you start to wonder, what's wrong with this idiot? But they go on complaining, repeating what they've already said. I love Hobbes' face in the last panel. You should frame that. And Hobbes says, maybe they're just not that self-aware. And then Calvin doesn't get the point. And boy, that's another thing that gets on my nerves. Aren't we like that? We complain about things, but we're guilty of the things we complain about. I don't like people who stop at intersections. Seriously. You know, it's a corner and then they, that's when they drop people off. It really irritates me, unreasonably. I'm like, Ugh! you know, I'm mad at injustice, corruption, and that. You know, it's all on the same level for me. <laughs> but you know, as much as I'm mad at that, when I do that, when I'm dropping off my friends, I don't want them to walk far. I'd rather drop them off at the, at the corner. I don't know the guy behind me. So if you're hassled, sorry, I don't care, but this is my friend. I'm guilty of the thing I'm condemning. That's what Jesus was talking about, Matthew 7, verse 3. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that's in your own eye? He's using a hyperbole, an exaggeration here, where yes, the guy has a speck, and you're making a big deal out of the speck, when we've got a tree growing out of our eye, and we can't even see that we're knocking people over with the tree, but we're so mad at them for what they have that's little. Right judgment is reflexive. It applies to ourselves first. Verse 5, first, take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Reflexive. Apply it to ourselves. You know how else we can be reflexive? When we acknowledge we have limited information. When we say, you're so wrong. There's something so messed up about you. We've assumed so much about their background. But if we are reflexive, we can say, you know what? 
I don't know if you're different to other people, but with the way you talk here in this office, or the way you talk to me, or the way it sounds to us, what are we admitting by using our words that way? We're admitting we don't have complete information. We're admitting we don't know what's going on in their heart. We don't know what God's doing with them. Knowing that, that kind of humility will change the tone of our voice, will change the words we use, will change our facial expressions, will change the angle of your eyebrows. Do not be so hard because we're not God. We don't know everything. The right kind of correction is reflexive. It applies to ourselves first. Before we condemn on social media, let's check ourselves. Very often what happens then is we realize, I'd rather not say anything <laughs> because I'm just as guilty. And that's fine. The right judgment is reflexive. Secondly, the right judgment is relational. Let's read those verses again and let's see what pops out. Matthew 7 verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Over and over again, Jesus is saying, this is your brother, this is your brother, this is your brother, this is a relationship. And too often our correction is fire and forget, you know, I just want to give a correction and then I'm gone. Where's the relationship there? No wonder people reject it. No wonder people reject the message of the Bible. We're so full of drive-by corrections, you know, sinful, 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 and then, and then, and then we just speed off. What, where's the chance to reconnect? Where's the chance to reconcile? When we give correction, when we give a judgment, it's almost like not only do they have to admit they're wrong, but they have to be embarrassed in the way that they do it. We don't give them a way to save face. We don't give them a, a way out. That shows them, look I, look, I really, really do care about you. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but here, could, could you do this so we don't embarrass ourselves more? It's different. If our tone is to, rec to, to reconcile, to build relationship with one another, it will change the way we make judgments. I saw this in action on the internet. And you know, we often see that, right? All these different feuds political feuds, theological feuds, I don't know, even like favorite TV show feud, all these people fighting on the internet. And so it's so refreshing to see people have a discussion that built relationship, not destroyed it. See, in 2012, January 2012, there was a video that came out by a Christian named Jefferson Bethke. And the video was entitled, Why I Love Jesus and Hate Religion. Some of you may have seen this. Some of you may have forwarded this video. And um, Jefferson Bethke does the spoken word thing with all the classic spoken word elements with all the soft voice, becoming loud, you know, and all the talking slowly, 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 talking fast, you know. So the usual uh, spoken word stuff. And then there's typography. So it's a very good video, you know, and it uh, has 30 million views now. So I saw it, it was being promoted, so I watched it, and 90% of it, I would say, is good. There is like 10% of like, mm, wrong theology or his own opinion and he's making it so this video because it was so popular was igniting a debate online lots of people who were mad at the church were saying i knew it this is why i hate the church because of this video now this guy is making a good point and lots of people who are conservatives were saying oh these are these super emo kids nowadays who don't really want to listen you know so there was this debate there was one christian author and pastor named kevin de young who's a great writer and kevin de young wrote a blog about this video and he took it apart line by line he just took every line this is good this is very good this is biblical this is not good this is not historically right this is inaccurate this is your own opinion this is unbiblical and he just ripped into it and i thought oh yeah come on kevin rip into this guy you know but then he did something else he did something nobody else did that i saw he ended the blog with this i know the internet is a big place but a lot of people are connected to a lot of other people, so who knows? Maybe Jefferson Bethke will read this blog. If you do, brother, I want you to know I love what you love in this poem. I watched you give your testimony and give thanks to God for His work in your life. I love the humble desire to be honest about your failings and point people to Christ. 
I love that you love the church and the Bible. I love that you want people to really get to the gospel. You have important things to say, and millions of people are listening. So make sure, as a teacher, you are extra careful and precise. James 3 verse 1. If you haven't received formal theological training, I encourage you to do so. Your ministry will be made stronger and richer and longer lasting. I encourage you to speak from the Bible before you speak from your own experience. I encourage you to love what Jesus loves without tearing down what he also loves. And people are apt to misunderstand. I encourage you to dig deep into the whole counsel of God. Totally different. It wasn't just the criticism. There was the relational outreach there. It, is, it was online. He didn't even know him personally. But he said, brother, I affirm what you're doing. And you know what? You've got to hand it to Jefferson Bethke also. He responded. He wrote an email to Kevin DeYoung and he said, Pastor Kevin, thank you for correcting me. I did not expect this video to go so viral. That's why I wasn't as precise in my theology. And so I appreciate you giving this correction and even correcting those who watch the video. Here are some things I'm thinking of doing. What do you think about them? And then Kevin DeYoung responded again. Thank you for responding this way. I love your heart. I love your passion. We need more young people like you who are on fire for Jesus. If you don't mind, can I post this exchange? And Jefferson gave the permission, and that's why we know the story. I blogged about it in my own blog Now, when I found out that story. You can go check it out. Why was the correction different? Because of the relational outreach. Because Kevin DeYoung wasn't just shaming him, saying, see, you're wrong. Mm, now will you say sorry? No, no. There was affirmation. There was a hand reaching out saying, I believe in your ministry. You're a good person. We just need to adjust this a little bit. How would our families look if we pronounce judgments on one another in this way? How would our marriages sound if we did that? I love my wife for being that way to me. There was one time I was driving home from work. I was so irritated about something. You know, I was like, oh, can you believe this department? They're, they're trying to stop me from making this move. Do they know who I am and what we've done in our campus ministry already? And then Carla just said, uh, sweetheart, I love you. And I'll always support you. But you're being really arrogant right now. And you don't need to, to be that way. Part of me was thinking, support me first, okay? Sakin mo muna, ba? But you know what? It was easier to correct. Why? Because of the opening line. It was relational. It wasn't shaming. Oh, yabang mo. Nasan si pastor, ba? It wasn't like that. But some of us, that's how we correct, right? We make them go the hard way. We make them kneel on Mungo before we'll forgive them. Naturally, the reconciliation won't happen then. Even at times, if we need to distance ourselves to protect ourselves, there is a way of doing it that is still relational, that tells the person, I need to distance myself because you're choosing a self-destructive lifestyle. But when you change, you will see, my hand is still reaching out to you. The door is still open. The bridge has not been burned. Right judgment is relational. Lastly, right judgment is restorative. Matthew 7, verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will clearly see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Too often our judgment, the only intention is to point out specks here and there. No, no, the point of judgment here is to remove specks, not to point them out. Mm, you have a speck, you have a bigger one, you have another one. Can I help you get that out of you? We, we, we don't want to look like this. So first, we're reflexive. We apply it to ourselves. Secondly, we're relational. And thirdly, our objective is not just to point out the wrong, but to help them get it right. To restore the person. To restore the relationship. We should ask ourselves that. When we post something online, what was our objective? Is our objective to restore the person and to restore the relationship? Or are we the classic spec noticer of the internet? That's a weird title to have. In the recent uh, uh, hurricane that hit the United States, there was a blog that went viral about people saying how Pastor Joel Austin was turning people out of Lakewood Church and not allowing his facility to be used for rehabilitation and rescue. And people shared it over and over again. 
including many Christians. Now, whether or not we agree with Joel Austin's theology is a different matter. But what was the intention in sharing that blood? To restore the person? To restore the relationship? Sadly, a few days later, it was proven untrue that the story that he wasn't sharing his facility was completely false. In fact, the first thing he did when the storm hit was to contact the government and say, Can we would, would you like to use our facility? And the government said, no, we can't because if we open those doors, it will be flooded. But some malicious media personalities wrote the blog and sadly, many Christians forwarded it. Ed Stetzer, who's a Christian writer, later commented, I wasn't disappointed that non-Christians shared the blog, but I was rather surprised that many Christians were first to stab our own kind. Are we restoring the person? Are we restoring the relationship? As a church, even when we make decisions to this, and there is a place for that. There's a place for wisdom. Verse 6 says, don't throw your pearls to the pigs. Don't throw what's holy to the dogs. In other words, if people just don't want to listen, fine, you got to protect yourself. There's a great book about that I've recommended to many of us in the church, Necessary Endings, about needing to cut off for yourself from people who are foolish and evil and insisting on destroying one another. The book is great, Necessary Endings, for getting away from that, but are we closing the door completely? See, even in the church, this famous thing of excommunication, what was the purpose of that? To cut people off from the church. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. Look at this. You are to deliver, deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. In other words, if they really won't listen, if they insist on sinning, they want to celebrate sin, they know the truth and they don't want to listen, fine, let them go. Let them go over to sin and live sinfully so that their flesh will be destroyed. But to what purpose? So that his spirit may be saved. In the day of the Lord. So that when they suffer the consequences of sin, they will say, gosh, this was wrong. I really need to turn to Jesus. And they will find a church, not with, mm, 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 what, what, what did I tell you? No, no. Come on. We've all made that mistake. Thankfully, there's still time. Let's repent. The objective is to restore the person and to uh, restore the relationship. Right correction is reflexive. It applies to ourselves. Right correction is relational. It's done in the context of building with the person. And thirdly, it's restorative. To help restore the person, not just to point out their flaws. How can we do this? How can we be this way? We can only be this way if we know we are not the ultimate judge. There is an ultimate judge. James 4 verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. If we know what God would do, you know, people say only God can judge me, only God can judge me. That's a scary statement to make. Because He will. And if we know how much God will judge the wicked, we would not be motivated with a, yeah, come on. We would be driven by compassion to be like, hey, you better listen now while you can. Because that judgment was going to fall on me and thankfully Jesus took the, pri the punishment from me and I want to reach out to you to pull you out of it. At the same time, we also know that because there is a righteous judge, should the wicked persist, should the violent persist, should the evil persist in what they do, there will be a reckoning. And I don't need to take that into my own hands. God will be the one to be just. Last story. When we were in South Africa, we had a day that my wife and I decided to go check out a market with our son, Philip. And Philip's in a very, uh, I don't know, judgmental stage of his development. May ganun bang childhood stage? Um, or maybe sa magulang, no? But um, we went to the market and it was closed. So Philip said, why is the market closed? So we asked the caretaker, why is the market closed? And he said, because protesters were here. I don't know why. They were protesting this market and they burned it. And Philip heard that. What? They burned the market? And, you know, he watches superhero movies, so he knows bad guys, you beat up bad guys. And so we were in the, the taxi going back to the, the place where we were staying, and he said, Papa, I want to beat up the bad guys. I want to hurt them. I want to fight them. They should not burn things. And I saw the taxi driver looking, and I was like, I wonder what his opinion is on the protests. So Carl and I looked at each other, we prayed, and he said, gave this answer. And he said, Philip, you know, 
the people that you're angry at. You want to hurt them. But you know, someone probably hurt them already also in the past. We only see them now burning things, but someone hurt them before also. This is why they're burning things. And if you hurt them now, I don't think they'll change. I think they'll just keep burning things. And do you think Jesus hurts us every time we do something bad? They're not being kind, but when we're not being kind, I'm glad Jesus doesn't hit us right away. So why don't we be kind to them and give them a chance to stop burning things? And if they don't change, then Jesus can be the one to, to take care of them and hurt them if he needs to. Is that okay, Philip? Okay, Papa. It wasn't ex as exciting as the superhero movies. But I think that will bring more healing overall in the world. So we got down from the car. Uh, the taxi driver turned around and said, we paid him. And he stopped me and he said, sir, thank you for the prayer. That helps me. Okay. See, there is a righteous judge. Wrong is wrong. Evil is wrong. Violence, wickedness, adultery, all of these things are wrong. God will judge. We don't need to take that into our own hands. Instead, we need to receive His mercy on ourselves first through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And because of that, we can be compassionate to other people as well. If they listen, great, we celebrate that. If they don't, we can trust our righteous judge. Let's judge rightly. What would our lives look like if we are reflexive first in our communication? We're relational and restorative. How will our office look? How will our marriage, our family conversations look if we talk to one another this way? I'll bet the office would think, what are you on? What are you doing? What, what changed about you? And you can just say, it's Jesus. To be the people He's called us to be, okay? Let's stand up and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives. Lord, we know that we have no right to assume your role as God, to judge people's motives, to predict people's eternal destiny, to predict people's future and say, you will always be, you will never change. Lord, right now we repent of taking that position that is not ours. And we say, you are God, we are not. You know everything, we don't know everything. You have the best intentions, we don't have the best intentions. Lord, we ask you to change our hearts even. To give us that humility that comes from knowing our place and knowing your place. Lord, we repent of the times that we've written people off, that we've judged them, that we've just said, ah, I just give up. Lord, some of us have brought correction. Part of it was well-meaning, but really a part of it was also not relational, that we didn't really know the person or hear them out first. We just dumped on them. We just machine gunned them with Bible verses and quotes. And Lord, we're sorry about that. Help us, Lord, today to see you first as the righteous judge. And the more we look at you and worship you, we pray that you will change our hearts. Change our minds. Lord, change the way we speak to one another. Lord, help us to be reflexive first, to acknowledge our own flaw in things, our own fault in things. Help us to be relational, Lord, to speak to people as brothers and sisters. And help us to restore things, Lord, the way you've called us to. Lord, we pray for our nation right now that's racked by all kinds of divisions, economically, politically, educationally, whatever, Lord. There's so much division. Help us to be people who will reach across that divide to judge the way you would judge, Lord because you've judged us well first. Thank you, Lord, that when we are at our wit's end and we say, I don't know what to do anymore, we can look to you and trust you. Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, to make all things right. So thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen.